everyone to our discussion on the lessons learned from COVID-19 and what the new normal looks like for business travel. My name is Felicity Burke and I'm General Manager of Fourth Dimension Business Travel Consulting. I'll be facilitating today's webinar. And thank you to CI Events who are hosting us today. Um, joining me for this event is our panel of leaders from Flight Centre Travel Group's corporate brands in Australia and New Zealand. We have with us today, Melissa Alf, General Manager, FCM Travel Solutions. Tom Wally, General Manager, Corporate Traveller. Gregory Lording, General Manager, Stage and Screen. And also joining us from New Zealand is Nick Quill, General Manager, Corporate Brands for New Zealand. We're excited to have you all join us today as we dive into the topic of COVID-19. Um, thank you to everyone who took the time to submit questions to our panel today. We'll be answering as many questions as possible on, on the call. If, if you don't get time, if we, sorry, if we don't get time to answer your questions, please reach out to our team after the webinar and they'll be able to help you with your um, answers to your queries. So to kick things off, let's jump into what's been the biggest learning for our travel management brand since COVID-19 took hold. So Mel, can you take us through what's been the biggest learning for FCM so far during COVID-19 and what has surprised you the most about COVID-19? Yeah, sure. Like, look, I, I think that when you're faced with a crisis of, of this magnitude, there, there has to be learnings, you know, about your business, about your people and even about yourself. And I think if you haven't learned something, that's probably a crisis in itself. So I, I think there's been many learnings and probably a couple for me have been, first of all, I think like, like all companies, we're not immune to this crisis. And, you know, we've had to make some significant decisions around staffing and priorities. And, you know, it, it hasn't been easy, but it's been, for me, a good lesson around vulnerability. And that's probably both our business and ourselves. Uh, and probably the second is um, the importance of our culture and the investment in our culture over the years has, without doubt, um, allowed us to shine through this, this crisis. So, you know, unfortunately for the people that we've had to stand down, they, they have just been so incredibly positive and resilient and understanding. And, and those that are still working with us are so committed um, and are really going above and beyond to ensure that we come through this stronger than ever. So, you know, I think without doubt, our culture has played a massive role in how our people are responding and reacting. Great, thanks, Mel. What about you, Tom? What about Corporate Traveller? Yeah, look, I can't agree with Mel more. The, the biggest thing that shone through through this is, is our incredible culture. Our people, uh, their support of each other, their support of their customers has been phenomenal. And the, the fact they've accepted decisions we've made with, with good grace uh, and, uh, and with, with real positivity has been incredible. And I guess, it's, as Mel said, it's a testament to 38 years of amazing culture that's been built up in this incredible company. So it's, it's great in situations like this we can see this uh, really act out right in front of our eyes, which has been brilliant. Um, I think a couple of other things I've learned. Our customers have been, have, they love us. They've been so supportive. Uh, we've had so many lovely messages from customers uh, of support and of gratitude for what we're doing and messages to our people saying, please look after them. And, and, and obviously we are uh, as best we can, um, which has been beautiful. And, and also um, really nice to be able to help our customers through this as well, because as, as Mel said, this is new for everyone. And uh, we've really learned that our customers do lean on us quite a lot for help, not just about travel, but about how to manage the business and how to, how to manage culture and so on and so forth. And the last thing I'd say is that I've learned as well that our model's great, that this one-to-one -one, uh, uh, personal travel manager that we have in Corporate Traveller, the business model that's behind it is really effective through these times. People do lean on people a lot. And uh, the, our model has been proven over and over through this crisis to be very effective at, at helping people through. So that's been, it's been great. It's been hard, as Mel said, it will continue to be hard as it is for all our customers, but some awesome learnings through this. Great. Thanks, Tom. Gregory, what about um, stage and screen? Well, if you go back a couple of months ago, nobody would have seen the force of the tsunami of this, how it would have come through and affected the world. So I think what it really taught us is to bring to life the world, think agile. You know, we can have all the best plans within there, but we didn't have the luxury quite often to go into the details. So you had to lead with both your, you know, your, your gut instinct and, and, and your, your mental health, uh, or, you know, mental health check to go in there and just lead and make these decisions um, to, to get the best possible outcome within it. But I think most importantly, it's the need to be transparent. So while we're navigating this and things were changing, you know, daily, 
is to be transparent to, to our people about the situation as well as our customers. And that's certainly the feedback we get now when we look back over the last six weeks is by being open and transparent. Customers and our people knew whether they stood at each given time. And you know, we could update that as changes happen, but an open transparency really provided a culture of caring, which I think really set us apart. And, and you're right, Gregory, in the sense that, um, you know, when we're for, forced to make a decision with a sense of urgency and to think differently, like I think the ideas and the um, initiatives that we've created and generated over this time has been outstanding. And I think the challenge and the question for all of us is like, how do we keep doing that all the time in a normal business environment? And that's, I think that's a good learning for us. Yeah. Thanks, Gregory. Thanks, Mel. Nick, what about New Zealand? Yeah, look, I think some fantastic um, topics have just been raised and I couldn't agree more, particularly um, with Tom talking about our people. The thing that I guess for me, it hasn't surprised me, but a huge learning is that the resilience of our people has been absolutely incredible. Um, no matter the position they've been in um, and no matter what they've had to take on, um, the resilience that has shone through and the strength of our people um, has been, been absolutely remarkable. Um, and sort of following on from what Gregory, Gregory was saying in terms of, um, you know, clearly communicating and, and being transparent with, with, with our people um, and constantly, um, you know, checking in and, and talking to them, making sure that, um, you know, you sort of alleviated any, any uncertainty where we could. So having those, those flows have never been more important. And I think finally for us in New Zealand, just on this topic, we, we've been on quite a... Um, a deliberate flexibility journey for the last probably two, two and a half years. And that's put us in really good stead coming into this, um, being able to adapt um, to the situation incredibly quickly. So, um, yeah, that's been really powerful. Good, good. Lots of, uh, lots of reflection on the, the personal side of what COVID-19 has done. So when, we've, um, when we're looking at the customer and um, as the customer has moved through this crisis, what's been the biggest challenge um, that's faced them? Nick, I might go back to you. Let's start with you around New Zealand and the customers there. Well, look, I think the biggest challenge, without a doubt, is the, the ever-changing, um, you know, spectrum of travel. It's daily, weekly, forget monthly, um, with announcements um, and decisions being made and, and changing positions within 24 hours has been absolutely incredible. And, and keeping up to speed on those um, has been really hard. So working closely with our customers and, and the implications that's had on their travel program, um, the speed at which it happened, having to, to move and have a, you know, um, getting clear data and, 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 and uh, interpreting that for them and helping on their journey. So, so what does that mean across the program and, and what does that mean to their business and, and balancing um, um, their employees' health and um, and the need to travel. So just going through that cycle so quickly was a challenge in, in itself and, and working uh, closely with our customers has, has really, I think, given them a level of um, support through this period um, that is, I mean, it's a word that's been overused, but it's unprecedented. Um, and, and that does really encapsulate it incredibly well. Um, but I think it's just, it's just, the day and the, and the week, the daily and the weekly changes and, and adapting to those and helping them navigate that. Great, thanks Nick. What about um, you Mel for FCM? Yeah, look, I think in the initial phase of the crisis, like our customers were definitely challenged with just getting their people home and, you know, as quickly and safely as possible. But as we, as we emerge through this crisis, I think people are now taking the time to look forward and you know, really try to understand what the crisis means for them in respect to their travel programs in the future. And so we're, we're getting asked a lot of questions like you know, with our crystal ball, when, when do we expect travel to return and what are our thoughts on social distancing when travel? Is it gonna become part of the norm? Um, you know, so as part of that, our customers are obviously focused on the risk and safety of their employees. And we're, we're seeing a lot of customers ask around you know, their travel policies and how they can adapt to those in response to, to risk. Uh, they're also, you know, every company is bunkering down at the moment in regards to cost and, you know, it's no different to ourselves and they're looking at how they'll manage cost move forward and, and as we emerge, people are going to be really cost conscious. So, 
you know, how can we potentially renegotiate agreements, which, which is actually going to be really challenging because we don't know how much customers will be traveling and what they'll be spending in the near future. So we're going to have to take a different lens when negotiating agreements. Um, and the other consideration really is the management of credits with airlines. So we've had mass cancellations across the board and companies have a huge pool of credits to manage with their future spend. So, you know, how are we going to help them to maximize these? So, you know, a lot of questions, I guess, on safety, risk and, and cost. Yeah, there's some really good points there, Mel. Tom, what about proper travel? I mean, obviously you've got such a, a, a diverse group of, of customers. What's, what's been going on there? Yeah, look, a lot of the customers have been saying to us that some of their challenges are very similar to ours. Um, but a lot of, if I can add one there around face-to-face -face conversations, um, a lot of customers are getting used to not having face-to-face -face conversations. And I can honestly say a lot of them don't like it um, in the same way that we don't like it. Good for uh, us. <laughs> <laughs> I think we're really we're really struggling with it. Our culture is one of of uh, face to face communication, as I think a lot of companies are. And the the benefits of that face to face communication uh, is quick decision making, um, abilities to to get your strategies in line quickly. The the little ca casual conversations you have in a hallway post a meeting or in the car on the way from the airport, that's all gone. And um, you know it's become a lot more formal. And I think if you're finding, you know, you, as I'm sure everyone's experiencing, you have to set up a Zoom or set up a, a WebEx, then you try and ring someone, they're on the phone, you have to phone them back, you can't get hold of them. And that whole process has been really drawn out. And I think you know, we've had a lot of, I think a lot of people are questioning, oh, will we'll be different coming back and will people just, just be happy doing Zoom meetings forever? Certainly the feedback from our customers and certainly the feedback from us as a company who travels a lot as well is, is no, absolutely not. that. It's really slowed down a lot of the decision-making process that companies have because, frankly, we're not used to having to type lots of things up and schedule calls and and um, deal with uh, over the phone all the time. And I think that I think it's uh, we got people itching to get back on planes and, and eyeball their 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 suppliers, their customers, and their staff so they can actually get their business moving quickly. So that's been a big challenge for a lot of our customers. Yeah, yeah, look, I agree on those last points too. I think everyone's itching to get back to normal. So Gregory, with, um, with Stage and Screen, obviously a, a very different um, traveller community there. Take us through some of the learnings. Yeah, look, apart from the travel, I think that, that you know, just looking after the creative entertainment and, and sporting industries, you know, these industries rely on large events, you know, so they've got an added complexity over, you know, general corporate travel per se, because they're all around getting, you know, the masses together for you know, even if you're just, you know, filming a production, et cetera, and the audience or, or the sporting arena is filling up with 100,000 people. So that's just been taken away, you know, overnight. And, you know, these are probably some of the last things that will come back in uh, into play as, as safety restrictions uh, come down. But what's uh, attached to that really is a lot of this in our industry uh, across these pillars relies on sponsorship. And a lot of the sponsorship that comes from many key suppliers out there and so you know we're all questioning what's that going to look like where's the sponsorship going to come um, into the sporting codes and to the entertainment companies by some of the suppliers what will their budgets look like post this so you know two front it's how soon can they get out there um, and get audiences back but how they're going to get those sponsorship streams filled up now certainly uh, a lot of artists have taken to zoom and we just helped organize the global citizens um you know with lady gaga uh, which is great but you know all the contact from our, our artists is that yeah they want to get back in in front of their people and get that fixed yeah yeah good thanks for that gregory um so we've spoken about our customers so let's focus now on um key suppliers for a minute so during a, a crisis like COVID 19 it's it's vital that you know, each of the TMCs are working closely with um, air and land partners. What's worked well for your brand and can you share an example that's happened? Um, Tom, I might just start with you. Okay, yeah, sure. Um, look, I guess at Flight Centre Travel Group's size uh, and, and dominance in the market uh, around the place allows us great opportunity to work with suppliers and partners to, to get the best outcome for our customers. And, and I'll give you an example of a, of a really cool example, actually, of what happened right at the start of this crisis. We, one of our clients in Melbourne, um, I won't name them, but they, they've been around for a long time, nearly 70 years, and they send a lot of people overseas to volunteer. Uh, and obviously, they were in, I think they were in 26 countries at the time where they had some of their people, over 400 of their people in 26 countries stuck all over the place. And then the government decided to close the borders and gave us a bit of notice to do that, not much, I think about two days. 
Um, and we work really closely with commercial airline partners as well as our own uh, wholly owned subsidiary admin, who I'm sure some of you are aware of, uh, to organise charters as well as as well as the commercial flights to get those. I think about 476 in the end volunteers back from overseas. And my teams in Melbourne worked really really hard to, through the night for three straight days with our customer and with our airline partners um, and our charter partners to get these people home. And it was a great story because they all got home back safely to their families. Obviously, they had to spend a couple of weeks in quarantine. I don't believe anyone was sick, so that was that was a great result. Um, and it's a good example of, of the power of people um, and, and the power of, of, I guess, flight centre travel groups, uh, global negotiating, allowing us to, you know, I guess, airline partners know when we call um, that, uh, that they want to help us out and then that we've probably got a problem and, and we did and it was proven over and over. So that was a, a great example of us working with our partners. Great, thanks, Tom. And it's um, it's that type of story where everyone moves so fast to 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 activate our our um, customers. Amazing. Uh, what about FCM? Yeah, look, we've we've got similar stories to Tom, where you know we had to repatriate a lot of passengers back from countries um, as well. But I think more broadly, like the one thing I absolutely love about working in the travel industry is that everyone just bands together when we need each other and we support each other. And I think we've really seen that shine in the industry over the recent weeks. And I guess broadly, we've been working with our suppliers to understand just the changes and the amount of changes and impacts to customers and, and their business and what it means for our customers. But um, we've got some specific examples where some of our mining and government customers are actually still traveling. And obviously they've been a little restricted with the amount of um, services around the country at the moment. So we've been working with airlines and charter companies to charter aircraft for our mining clients and we're actually on selling spare seats uh, for other customers that can't afford to, to charter entire aircraft as well. And we've negotiated uh, long stay accommodation rates um, for travellers that require self-isolation. So particularly with those mining customers, when a lot of their FIFO come from interstate and they actually need to sit out the quarantine period before they start work. So we've been helping out with that. And then uh, on top of that, we booked thousands and thousands of room nights for incoming travellers requiring mandatory self-isolation so you know our, our suppliers have been really supportive and I think you know we're all in this together and we all want to come through. Great thanks Mel. Nick what about um, New Zealand? Yeah look we, we had a, a fantastic example of, of how strong um, our relationship uh, is over here with um, our key partner in New Zealand. Um, I can still remember the day so the 14th of March it was Saturday afternoon and uh, our Prime Minister Jacinda Ardern announced at 4 p.m. that the borders would be closing on Sunday night at midnight. So it was about 30 hours heads up um, and we just got slammed with calls, thousands of calls, um, volumes that we never could have even imagined that we'd experience. At about five o'clock, or just after five o'clock, um, our account executive um, from Air New Zealand called me um, and offered Air New Zealand resources to come in and sit at um, in Auckland head office and work with us to repatriate um, customers, um, helping with waivers and favours and just um, work through the process with us to get hundreds more people home than we would have been able to. And that was within a 30 hour period. Um, they stayed on the ground with us for that week for another few days. And, and then we had daily check-ins with them to just ensure the status of um, our customers was, was all, all in hand. Um, and you know any special requests or needs were, were accommodated. So you know the relationship that we have with Air New Zealand here is is amazing. Um, and to have that sort of support uh, for them to be on the phone to me Saturday um, as I was going out for a, for a drink um, was fantastic oh, for us to have that. Okay. Yeah, <laughs> um, I was actually going to the theatre that night, Book of Mormons. Um, but um, yeah, look to have. To have that support um, is, is what it's all about. And so that was a fantastic outcome here. Gosh, Nick, you know what? It's, um, it feels like the last month has flown by and you've given me you know, sort of chills uh, listening to that story. So, um, yeah, thanks for sharing that. I remember all that. Uh, Gregory, what about your suppliers um, working with stage and screen? Well, we were just coming off the tail end of, you know, the summer season, which is really big for, you know, touring and events, etc. But we had one very, very large event still to go and it was only a couple of weeks away and, you know, had to pull the plug due to the, the, the safety regulations that came into play. And, you know, this, you know, 
large event, um, you know, we had to pull all the accommodation away at the, uh, at the last moment. So it's really working with those preferred suppliers of ours to, to move the, uh, the event, even though it hasn't been moved yet, but to move any funds attached to it to an unpredetermined date down in the future, um, as well as negotiate a, a waiver of many other preconditions, payment conditions on that, which totaled about you know, half a million dollars uh, for this one client. And you know, that was leveraged off this with the client, but also because we just look after this, this sector and industry, um, you know, we were able to, to leverage that to say, you know, we, we, we channel your, uh, our clients into your properties because they have unique uh, niches with, you know, apartments and long stay requirements, et cetera, within that. So it was just a great outcome um, for, for the client, but also for the supplier to realise that, you know, we've, built, we've still got to build bridges into the future. It's not just about now. Great. So before we move to, to looking forward, um, what are the, the top three tips that you can give businesses to keep going through um, a crisis? And Gregory, I might just I hand back to you um, to answer that one. Yeah, look, I think, you know, first of it, you know, there's a lot of emotion going in the adrenaline, but, you know, first I think it's, it's you know, the, the KISS approach, keep it simple in a sense, like you've got to go back into that fighting mode. But it is that, you know, most businesses, we all have business plans and we've broken them down into 90 day goals. So it is revisiting those. And again, also working with a lot of our smaller customers who may not have those. So it's really like, this is the time to plan. So when you've got a plan, bring it out and reevaluate it or use it to create a plan uh, within that. I'd also say the second part to that is to communicate, you know, so obviously we have new ways to communicate now, but it is to communicate that plan. And even what you don't know to, to your people, um, most importantly through these times is to say, we're working on things as we go through that. So it's communicating that. And also I'd say setting new goals because we're used to in whatever business is where we, we send, set our goals generally you know, end of financial year, et cetera, whether it be financial or other people goals. All of a sudden that's gone. So we've had to redefine and give, give quick wins. So you know, what are the wins this week or, or next month? So we keep, keep your people motivated uh, now um, and realise that you know, a big win may not be uh, into the future. And, and finally, all this is you know, the luxury of time we've got now, you know, this is where we can do the housekeeping. I know we're all at home now and we say we'll do all the chores we never did. Same in our business, you know, all those little things that we never get to do, this is the time to do it. Nick, do you have anything else to add for New Zealand? Yes, some similar stuff uh, to, to uh, Gregory, but I think for me, it's about connecting with people, preserving your culture and delivering a clear message. I think, I think there's a lot, but if you can connect with your people, over-communicate, um, keep the channels open. Uh, to Gregory's point, if, if you don't know the answer, um, you know, you're endeavouring to, to, to get to that answer. Um, preserving your culture, um, you know, having been with flights into a travel groups since sort of the late 90s, um, the culture we have is so important. So for companies to preserve you know, their DNA and their culture and their heartbeat in, in this time is so incredibly important. So, you know, you know, be serious and, and get, get your plans underway and, and control what you control, but, but have fun and enjoy each other's company and still, you know, so still have those balances. Um, and I think I touched on this earlier, but delivering a, a clear message with, with transparency and honesty. Um, because no one needs a sugar-coated story at the moment. You know, everyone needs to know how it is um, and, and, you know, what we can expect and, and what we can control it and then what we have to, I guess, just try and influence. So, yeah, for me, it's about connecting, uh, preserving and, and delivering those messages. Great. Thanks, Nick. Tom, what about you? Well, it's good to know that we as a leadership group globally uh, kind of agree on the same thing because uh, essentially... I'm the same. Double down on your on your core assets. Our core asset is our people and our culture, and and uh, it's got us through so much before, and it'll get us through everything now, and and, and it's become even more important. Um, over communicate, stay connected. Be number two, the same as same as Nick. I think uh, if you can remain connected, even if it's just a text message every day to people, or a little post on our, on our internal sites, or a WhatsApp, or whatever it may be, just stay connected is really, really important. And thirdly. As, as Nick's kind of alluded to, um, in this company, we've been uh, we're, we're brought up 
and we, we, we're retained and we stay in this company because we're, we're authentic leaders. And this is a great time to demonstrate that to your people that this is hard for everyone, including us. And uh, coping with this is unprecedented. So authenticity and leadership is always important, but now that authenticity and, and therefore vulnerability really shines through. So that'd be my three tips and, and it sounds like pretty similar to everyone else. Yeah, great. And Mel, what, what else could you share? Yeah, very, very similar themes. But I guess I guess on the, the communication front, I, I agree, strong communication, but it, it's almost balancing that reality with the optimism as well. So, you know, making sure we're talking about where we're really at and what we're facing and the challenges we have, but also painting that picture of the future as well. Um, but one thing I have learned about communication, interestingly, is that I think the simplest of messages are often the most effective and I think it's been amazing that in the past we've always had to do fancy video productions to talk to our people or our customers yet in this time we're actually using zooms or iPhone videos and it actually seems to be more authentic right now so you know maybe there's a learning in that moving moving forward uh, but also just I guess around the plans of the business look at what changes you can implement and control right now we're all, you know, under-resourced at the moment, but you can come out of this stronger if you have, you know, little goals and plans to attack. And then um, probably finally is just using the time to reflect on the business and, and reimagine and, you know, how can we do things potentially differently? And I think, you know, we've all gone without some things. So, you know, what's going to be necessary and what's truly going to make a difference to our business moving forward. So I think it's a good time to rediscover. Yeah, great. Thanks, Mel. So let's move to, to looking towards the future, um, which I think is what everyone's keen to, to understand. So it's still unknown when the world will start travelling again and when it will return to normal. Over 15 weeks, we've seen 75% of global airline capacity cut. And in recent weeks, several regions around the world reducing their seat capacity to 90%. And then in early April, air travel in domestic China started to open up and now in New Zealand, um, you know, the government has eased their COVID-19 restrictions, which is allowing some you know, essential, um, very small amount of domestic travel across um, some of the small cities, key cities and um, on small routes. So whilst a really very narrow view of what the future will hold, it's with both excitement and some nervousness that we watch some of these domestic markets open up and start to travel again, albeit a very small amount of travel. So with that in mind, what will the pain points be for travel programs in the coming months as the world begins to travel again and how will you help businesses overcome these? And what are, what are the businesses doing now in order to prepare and be ready to restart their travel program? So, so Mel, I might just start with you on that question, group of questions. Yeah, sure. I, look, I think the biggest pain point right now for everyone is actually just the unknown. So, you know, we, we actually don't really know when travel is going to recommence or when borders around the world will potentially open or, you know, are they going to have quarantine restrictions as they open and is there going to be social isolation requirements? So it's, it's that almost that fear of the unknown that we can't plan for right now. But I think, I think what is important is that as it continues to evolve, evolve, we do continue to inform our customers, um, you know, and react quickly to how we can assist. But like asking about the right now, what customers are focusing on, I think first and foremost, they're focusing on the health, health and safety of their people, um, but then focusing on the things that they can control. So, you know, we're, we're seeing customers at the moment using this time to implement some of the technology that they didn't have time previously. Uh, they're reviewing travel policies that, you know, primarily focused on cost control and negotiating supplier agreements. Um, but I just, I think overall, it's just important that we spend time now with our customers just so they feel supported and prepared. Because ultimately, when travel does come back, that they want to focus on their business, not, not on travel policies. Great. Thanks, Mel. Tom, what about you? Yeah, I think uh, if I zoom in on the traveller per se, as opposed to uh, the, the company decisions, I think um, there'll be a fair bit of traveller anxiety, for want of a better term, um, on return here. There, I think there will be plenty of people who are road warriors, uh, such as myself, who, who uh, may be nervous about getting on a plane. What does that mean? May have family members who say, why are you going back to getting on planes again? Um, I, I agree with Mel. We're, we're unsure what those rules look like and are you going to have to be tested prior to travel? and when you get on the plane, what happens? And will there be a middle seat or will there not be? Uh, when I travel somewhere else, 
what's going to happen? Is it is it a place where I, where there are different rules and so on and so forth? So I think we're really going to have to coach customers through that as best we can, um, because some people people deal with things in different ways, and uh, there certainly will be people who will not be that keen to get on planes and 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 that keen to stay in hotels and and uh, and put themselves at risk. So I think traveller anxiety uh, will be a big one. And then I think the other thing from a decision making point of view, companies being making decisions about what travel looks like in the future, you know, I think much like through the GFC back in, in 08, 09 or through 9-11, um, travel spends will, will probably be reviewed. Uh, companies will, may take different rules to where they sit on the plane, whether it's the front of the bus or the back of the bus, um, hotels they stay in, so on and so forth. Uh, they'll be they'll be thinking about that traveler safety piece in mind as well. So. I think help, us helping to navigate through that and um, what that looks like, and uh, you know, I think as I mentioned earlier, I think there'll be, a, I think there'll be an initial kind of sugar rush around people just desperate to get back in front of their people, their customers, their suppliers, so they can actually be face to face. But there'll also be a, a fairly strong pull from companies who have suffered a bit financially through this to go, hang on a second, can we do this differently, and what does that look like? And uh, there's going to be a lot of help needed to navigate that as it unfolds through these uh, through these new times, whatever that looks like. Yeah, great, Tom. Lots of definitely lots of questions coming from customers. So, um, Nick, what about what about you? Yeah, look to, to what Tom and Mel said. I think it is we don't know what we don't know yet. Um, so this is where we can partner with our customers and walk that journey um, and having those tight relationships with suppliers. I think. You know, current travel programs probably won't match the new state, what the new state may be. And so it's having that, the, the um, appetite for, you know, being able to change and, and that agile approach to what their program might look like. So I feel like there's going to be a new sort of, um, uh, I guess, tension in, in the travel decision, um, I guess, process to, to what Tom was saying about the traveller and traveller confidence and traveller health. Um, so whereas it might be, you know, flying on carrier A or B, it's flying on carrier A or B, or does the traveller want to go? Um, and so it is walking that journey with them. And, and um, you know, so then for the customer, it's about the business requirement versus, you know, that traveller actually wanting to travel. Um, and so I think it'll be, you know, we can play a part there, giving them confidence on that journey. Um, to what Tom said as well, and you know, in destination when they're there, how we connect them, how we give them real time updates, how we look after them, um, how we give them the comfort that if something were to happen, what we can do to make them safe. So I really do think the lens, um, while travel programs have always addressed the traveller to an extent, I think travel programs may have to embrace, embrace the traveller more and, and understand their their feelings to an extent in, in, in the whole process. So I think that's going to be a really um, interesting dynamic coming out of this. Yeah, great. Thanks, Nick. I think this last month has really tested um, what we are really all capable of um, giving to our customers as well. Uh, Gregory, what about stage and screen? I think I'd like to agree, you know, with Mel, you know, there's a real focus at the moment with customers to actually, you know, dive into their travel program and certainly take use of a lot of the technology we've had on the shelf, which for some of our healers has been, you know, uh, slow to uptake. So, you know, they're really seeing the value and the need of that um, or tra open transparency that some of our technology does provide. But I, I also see there's sort of a, the next with suppliers out there, you know, how are we going to, they're going to get confidence back in the market. So whether it be airlines or hotels, like we know that there are safety ratings out there for airlines like Skytrax and how amazing, you know, service is on a grading system. But I, I, I see that we'll be working with suppliers and coming up with some form of confidence and guarantee with suppliers to go, we guarantee our hotel rooms are cleaned. You know, that sort of thing. That's the stuff that's going to start to put confidence in there. And so when we renegotiate, you know, uh, supply contract for our customers, we're going to be, you know, looking at ways that we can guarantee this or give some comfort of mind on that to, 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 to give the confidence for people to start travelling again. Yeah. And I think there's that added, added layer to still, still to come. Yeah, I totally agree, Gregory. Um, so I think we've got some, some questions to, to run through. So um, first up is, um, first question, will the industry ever recover? So I don't know who wants to um, jump in on that one. I, I, I'm happy to. Um, if we're talking about the travel industry, 
Absolutely. I, I, I think there's there's no greater certainty than uh, the industry will, will not only recover, but will go back to levels of growth as it was prior to this even starting. It may take a little while. I'm not expecting it to happen in May. Uh, but uh, I think certainly over the course of the next 18 months, I, I, my prediction and certainly that of most of us in the industry is that it will get back to not only the levels it was, but, uh, but more so. Travel is, uh, both leisure and corporate travel, is one of life's great pleasures and joys and, and what we've seen over the last 20 years is it's been opened, those doors have been opened up to more and more people uh, with the onset of cheaper airfares, low cost carriers, more more hotel stock, great places to go on holidays. So I think the industry at large, the travel and tourism industry, which is the biggest, one of the biggest industries in the world, I think it's, it's something worth something like $9 trillion and employs about five or 8% of the world's population uh, will absolutely come back bigger and better. I think the, the the industry around corporate travel um, and, and travel management, uh, this I think things like this prove over and over um, the value of having a travel management company in your travel program. Uh, the risk of it sounding like a sales pitch, there's no question that um, things like this uh, should turn people more to the fact that my God, I really need a person, uh, a good system, um, and 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 some expert advice in the way of my travel program because this is uh, these things are very hard to navigate. Travel's tricky enough as it is without the current situation. Um, so I think people will have, will have realised that even more through this. And it'll, it'll bounce back. I think we're, we're pretty resilient human. We will, we will come back pretty quickly the minute we get the opportunity. And even if we're only holidaying Nick in New Zealand for the next six months, we still, <laughs> um, I, think, I think it's going to be a boon for New Zealand tele, um, uh, tourism over the next six months. We're all, we're all going to be piling over your, over your borders to get an overseas trip in. So um, I'm excited about the next bit. I can't wait to get on a plane and go and do something. Yeah, I don't think you're alone there, Tom. I think, <laughs> and I think we, we don't we need to remember that we've we've been through crises before as an industry, and you know it may not be to this magnitude that we're experiencing today, but we've been here before and we've recovered before, and it may be a slow recovery, as Tom says. But you know I, I don't think we should forget either that corporate travel people are travelling to generate business and to generate sales, and everyone's going to want to get back on a plane to do that and to grow their businesses again. So. You know, we've got great hope that that's going to recover quickly. And I'm with you, Tom. I, I personally can't wait to go on a holiday. So I'll be the first <laughs> and going somewhere. <laughs> well, I think just to round that out, I don't think we can ever substitute face-to-face -face connection. Um, we've all become quite familiar with video calls. Um, I think I'd done, I myself might have set up three before we went into this situation. Now I think I've set up about 75. Um, so we've, be we've become really familiar with it, absolutely. But you just cannot be face-to-face -face connection and interaction. And that's, for me, that's a core human need. And I think that in itself is going to help our industry take off again to greater heights. So I couldn't agree more. No, yeah, 100% agree on that. You know, certainly across our pillars, you know, in the past when there's been a crisis, you tend to find sporting and entertainment rebounds first because, you know, like travel, entertainment, it's in that DNA. People want to get out there. People want to explore and be entertained, you know, and I think it, with any crisis, it, it, it makes companies, you know, the, the smart ones, you know, emerge faster, you know, and use this time to, to, to as Mel said, reimagine their business. And it is, it is, you know, survival of the fittest. And it's a good thing because I think all companies, you know, relearn and, and come out of this smarter. Great. Thanks, Gregory. Thanks, everyone. I think that was uh, good insights there. Um, so. Last question we've got time for is um, what type of business do we believe um, will return first? So what, what type of uh, industries do we think are going to return first to travel? I, I can jump in and start, I guess. Uh, I, I think, you know, we're already seeing today that, you know, some of our mining and government customers are actually still trading through this crisis as best we can. So I think the minute that uh, the airlines open up more inventory, they're going to continue to grow and adapt pretty quickly. Um, so definitely mining and government, but then, you know, certainly our services businesses as well. I think, you know, as I've said previously, people, people need to generate income and, you know, sales themselves. So I think we'll see some of those high services business recover pretty quickly. Yeah, we, we've seen um, with the lifting of, of level uh, four, the, the movement of level four to three here construction, uh, is firing up again really quickly. So, you know, it's really, really moving along quite fast here in New Zealand and, and similar 
system. You know, we've, we've had the government ticking along um, through this process with the isolation cases and the quarantine cases and all that. So um, the construction definitely staying prior very quickly. Yeah. I'd, I'd probably just add, I think the beauty of the, of the Australian economy is it's very primary industry focused. And, um, and the other part is our major trade partner is China. So we've got this great little, uh, little path forward here where the, a lot of our companies across our corporate brands are connected to primary industry, be it mining or agriculture or, uh, or construction, as, as we said, and, and, our, and a lot of them trade with China. So both of those channels are open and uh, they should be pretty quick to come back once the inventory comes on board, even the services attached to all those places. So um, I'm with Mel, I think uh, the Australian market uh, can bounce back, uh, particularly with domestic travel, but also with those trade, those trade options overseas really, really quickly. Uh, and there could be a fair bit that comes on board um, as soon as that inventory comes, becomes available. Right. Yeah. I, I'd say just for, you know, our sectors, you know, you know, news always goes on and, you know, it's the content and the stories that need to get out there. So as we see it, you know, relaxed a little bit more, a lot more TV productions will start coming off. They may have closed audience, a bit like sport. You know, a lot of sporting ones are talking about sort of self-isolating and playing without audiences. And probably the, the last to recover at this stage will be, you know, the, the large public events like the Turing Acts, et cetera, at this stage. And when that does relax, we may even actually see an upsurge in Australian talent and shows if international borders remain closed. So there's a fair bit of optimism there about using local talent before we bring in uh, overseas talent. All right, Gregory, there's only so many reruns of Suits I can watch, mate. So uh, hopefully you get some productions going soon. Yeah. Good. Thanks, Gregory. And thanks, Tom. Um, so we, we're just about out of time. Um, so we'll wrap up the discussion for today. Um, firstly, I'd like to thank, um, thank our panel members for their time today. We hope the audience found the, the value of this um, session valuable and a great insight into how travel management companies have been working through COVID-19 and also the positive signs to, to look out for as the travel industry starts to recover. As I mentioned at the start of the webinar, if, you, if your question wasn't answered, we do apologise. Due to timing, we just haven't had um, the opportunity to answer everything, but we will contact you after the webinar to help with any queries that you might have. So thanks for that. Thank you all for attending today's presentation. Look out for an invitation to our next webinar on the 30th of May where you, we will host a, a panel with our industry partners and associations to dive into how each sector of the industry has been impacted by COVID-19 and their plans to bounce back post-COVID. Thanks everyone and stay healthy. Thanks everyone. Thank you. Bye.